Welcome to the latest in this series of Cookbook live stream and Q&As. I'm Matt Cockerell, the co-founder of Cookbook, and today I'm joined by a panel of cheese experts. Um, I'm looking forward to a great discussion on all different aspects of the world of fine cheese. Uh, and today on the panel, we have Fran Ward, who is going to be leading the conversation. Fran is a, a cookbook author with several books on cookbook, including New Bistro, The French Kitchen, and The French Market. She is the co-founder of uh, the Chiswick Cookbook Festival, and more recently, Chiswick Cheese Market, uh, which is the only dedicated cheese market in London. Um, and then we also have Mary Quick, who is the managing director of Quick's Cheese, which is a family farming business in Devon with a 500 year history. And then finally, we have Perry James Waitman of Rennes and Rhind in Cambridge, who is the winner of the UK's inaugural Affineur of the Year Award. And we'll be finding out more about what that means later. Um, so during the course of the discussion, please feel free to ask your questions via the uh, Q&A box. And you can also send messages uh, via the chat. Uh, and so with that, I will hand over to Fran. Hello, everyone. We are delighted um, to be on the Cookbook Kitchen um, live stream. And it's our pleasure to have Mary, um, who, as Matt said, home farm in beautiful Devon. They've been farmers for 15 generations. She's just handed it over to her daughter or partially handed it over, Mary will tell us exactly, um, where they hand make cheeses, which are very fine British cheddars. They've just launched the used milk cheese, but that's only seasonal. And Mary, what Mary doesn't know about cheese, hard cheeses, the English do not know about a good cheese. And then we have, look at Mary's face. <laughs> then we have Perry, who um, won, as Matt says, the Affinia of the Year, um, which was set up by Mary of Quick's Cheese. So it's very exciting that we're all together. And then to bring it back round, um, the Chiswick Cheese Market is sponsoring next year's Affinia of the Year. Now, I'm going to start with what is an affinia for those of you who don't know. So Mary, can you please describe and then we will let the winner tell us what he did to his cheeses. Well, an um, affinage, it, I mean, we don't even have an English word for it. Isn't that so crazy? It's that it's that discipline. Now, I just need to apologise. I was eating mulberries before, uh, dry, dried mulberries and my tongue's a bit weird, so uh, I'm <laughs> quite self-conscious about it. But anyway, um, you look beautiful. <laughs> so kind. Um, so um, affinage is that is how you mature cheese. And in this country, uh, and we don't have a word for it because in this country, in the main, cheesemakers mature their own own cheese. And so, kind of, we do what we do. And uh, but what? But on the continent, um, very often. The fruitiers make the cheese and they go then to an affineur to, to be finished. That's what the word means, to be finished. So, um, uh, uh, and I wanted to set up affineur of the year because I knew what I knew about maturing our cheese, but I just felt there might be a whole world out there to learn. And I could only do that when I got the attention of some amazing people like Perry on the case. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you. That's super exciting. So Perry, tell us, out of there were about 15 cheeses that entered from people like Grindiza, Paxton and Whitfield, um, other people who joined in. And what did you do to yours? Because I know that on all the stands, because I was lucky enough to be there at this awards, which was in London, um, you were sort of like the nutty professor. Thanks. I take that as a compliment. <laughs> I mean, it is a compliment. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm very um, detailed in, you know, because basically, you know, uh, what, what you're doing with cheese, you're using selective pressures, you know, brushing, turning, washing, uh, changing humidity, humidity and temperature to get the best out of that cheese. You know, so you're visually analysing, sometimes taking cores from the cheese and working out what you think that it needs. Um, so, yeah, essentially, when uh, I was given the cheese, which eventually we named Pris Priscilla, which everyone absolutely loves, um, being, her, her being called Priscilla, 
you know, we, we kind of analyzed the detail that Mary gave her. And then, you know, we kind of felt the moisture in the cheese and worked out that it could do with a bit more temperature. So we like rocked it up. It worked between 11 and 13 degrees, gave it a, a kind of a different brushing method every time. And yeah, like, like you said, I'm kind of hyper detailed because essentially if I do something to, to a cheese and there's a good outcome, if I find a cheese that's similar, I want to flick back through those notes and try and replicate it. So, um, yeah, so we had like a six page presentation, which we forced everyone to, to boringly read through. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> um, fascinating. But, we, you know, doing the same this year, we're, you know, because we're obviously re-entering this year and we're doing the same, you know, kind of technique. But last year, obviously, I wanted to do what I'm known for, which is mature a good cheese, give it everything that it needs. Where I feel like this year, because I've, you know, without ego, I've won, I can be a bit more experimental. So, uh, so yeah, I'm being far more experimental on, on this year, year's cheese. Okay, brilliant. And just tell me, Mary, has this year's um, competition already started? Yep. Now, last year we sent off the cheeses, the cheeses at three, uh, three months old. And this year, particularly, I noticed there's some people from the United States there. So, so there's some um, um, some American research that suggests that the, the the really very much the 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 maturation is very much set up in that first week. So that's when we sent these these little cheeses off. And this year we sent off because we wanted people to. To mature several different styles of cheese or be able to do that if they wanted we sent off instead of a 27 kilo wheel we sent off an eight kilo wheel which perry is showing there, there you it go is. it's right and here. what's she yeah. called this year perry i'm not naming everyone's i i, I name my cheeses in kind of private and uh, and i kind of let it slip on a live that we did so no name yet, you know, I, I, I name them weirdly after the characteristics they give off. And this one is, is giving off a lot of characteristics, but it's a little bit too soon to name. But it's a remarkable cheese. We're really happy we use this experimental technique. So I don't know if you can see the mold growth that's going Ooh. on there is, is kind of, it's exploded. So we kind of use this uh, uh, um, method, which is kind of a new method, which we've dubbed the Perry cheese clamp. Uh, a, a, a mold clamp, sorry, which is essentially eight. We age three cheddars that kind of match the profile of what we thought quicks would be, and then we got two cheddars and we clamped them so they were aged for a further twelve months. They kind of really went wild on the outside in terms of the microflora and molds are outside, and then clamped the two cheeses on top of them to really impart that aggressive microflora that's on there. And uh, yeah, after a week, the cheese just started to explode. So, um, so we we keep the temperature around between ten and eleven, slightly lower this time because um, you know it's a smaller cheese. We don't want too much moisture escaping, um, and you know a regular turning when it's younger and then then aging through. But so pleased with it at the moment. The, the, the flora. So, in about three months' time, I'm going to begin scratching off these microbes on the outside and analysing what microbes survived on the cheese and how hopefully we'll be able to detect some of them in the flavor. How long will you be proving maturing that cheese for this time? Because you've had it for three months. Yeah, how, um, I'm trying to think, Mary. When's the, when's the competition? Is it around June, March? It's, yeah. Isn't it June? Uh, June. We go. Yes, yeah. I believe it's, yeah, I believe it's June. Sorry, I, I, uh, yeah, I don't have that. Okay, so you've me, got it yeah. for longer this time. And Perry, tell us where you are. And oh, yes. I know that... Yeah, tell us about your room, your baby room you're in that you, is your new love. Yeah, so this is our brand new maturing room. So uh, we, we, we built, so, so we had two maturing rooms before and one kind of storage room. So we're building four new rooms, uh, which will give me more variety in what I can mature and, uh, and also, you know, containing microbes and things like that, building up. But yeah, this is the first live I've done in this room. So We've got uh, all new shelving that's in here, you know, that, that will react really well to wood. Everything that we learned from the two rooms, we've poured into these rooms. And yeah, I, I, I've got two racks so far. So the next four weeks, I'll be transferring from over. But we've got these nice windows that run down the outside of the uh, maturing room. So, you know, hopefully if anyone comes by, they can see me slaving away on the cheese, you know. <laughs> okay. And Mary, tell us about your 
farm and how it operates because you milk the cows on the farm and make the cheese on the farm. Yeah. So we've got a herd of cows, our crossbred cows that, uh, um, and the, the, what I'm looking for in that cow is a girl who's very happy to be grazing for almost all of the year, for as long as the ground is fit. And also whose who's milk, the characteristics of that milk is, is, uh, is great for our cheese. So I'm, we, I spend a lot of time being quite nerdy thinking about that. And so we, we're out, they're out grazing grass for most of the year. So pretty, Christmas Eve, they're from um, Valentine's Day to Christmas Eve, they're grazing. And um, well, depending on the weather, of course, and um, and and we milk the cows. Um, we hand make the cheese in relatively small vats, you know, small batches. We hand cheddar, which is the process of turning those blocks of curd over and over to to get moisture out. Um, and we use we uh, stop that uh, acidity development. Uh, progression with Cornish sea salt and then we um, uh, cloth bind them in uh, 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 put the curd into molds and bind them with cloth and put them into our mature our nursery maturing rooms and then into our, our cheese cathedral uh, where we taste them to, to see how the maturing is getting on particularly at three months and 12 months old. And tell me, throughout the seasons, do you find the milk varies and they need to be matured for longer and you need to vary things? Yeah, I mean, the milk is really quite different. I mean, with both with the stage of lactation that the cows are at, you know, late lactation milk is is very rich, but makes not such a is is a more difficult milk to use. And, you know, I always think, you know, the minute they go out on the grass, you get this additional layer of 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 flavor and aroma in the in the milk and obviously in the cheese because that's concentrated milk and um, there's something about in spring when you get the sort of more herbs and flowers the complexity of the milk is really super rich there and almost changes this very subtly the flavors oh absolutely and and the minute they go out to grass and you get that fresh grass it feels like you get that through and I always think that in the summer where you get the I don't know if it's true I think that when you get the the, the clover flowering you that lovely those lovely aromatics I think uh, I think some of those June July cheeses are um are some of them are the loveliest I think and then and then I then this time of year where you've got this amazing um flush of grass growth after the summer I mean yes I like September well actually I like cheese from all year round it but it is slightly slightly more closed in flavors perhaps just in that in the depths of winter in in December and January would the average person be able to taste those or is it the very sort of educated palate that can taste the difference I it well it's difficult to distinguish them I mean, because we're tasting these months, uh, you know, every vat fr from a month, you can see the way that that changes. And I think that, um, Perry, you've been to a grading and you can see those yeah. changes. But I think yeah. if if you just had one cheese and somebody challenged me to say, where's w which month is that from? I think that would be really difficult. Yeah, I, I, you know, just to chip in, I think you know, everyone really craves after a huge amount of like seasonality in their food, you know, like it just, it just, it, you know, to be perfectly fair, it sells a great story. But I think with cheese, it's, it's very nuanced. Um, that's in there and like, obviously Mary's trying her cheese day in, day out, and you'll be able to set the differences. But where I think the general population can notice the difference is just the feel. You know, as you put it on your tongue and it tastes amazing, you know, that's the one that, you know, it's just a different level. And you can't really, you know, you know you'd know, you have to be hard pressed to pick out clover and things like that. And like, like you're kind of alluding to, Fran, that, that but you just get a, 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 you know, a great cheese. I think one place that you can really notice it is in sheep's milk cheese, you know, when lambing season, colostrum is rich in the, uh, is in the milk. And when you get cheese in that season, that's when I think you really notice that richness and that buttery coming up. That, that's the most 
seasonal cheese I know to sheep's milk when they when they come around. I don't know if you agree, Mary. Yeah, I think so. I probably don't actually. I probably don't haven't eaten enough sheep's milk cheese um, mm. at different seasons to notice that that change. I mean, we 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 bring in some ewe's milk, but we tend to get it, you know, at yeah. one time in the spring. So I don't. I haven't. I don't. I'm not sure. I would know. I think. I think for me, the impact of the grass fed, um, and I think you may be able to get this, is that because the um, from grass, the, the, the fat chains are a bit shorter. And mm -hmm. so they're a bit more melty. And I mm -hmm. think because our cheese is one of the most grass fed of the, of, 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 of the cheeses that you can buy, then I think our cheeses do have a, that sort of melty, a lovely melt, I think, mm -hmm. a, a quite a sort of luscious quality. Whereas um, many cows are fed on, for instance, maize, a maize silage and that is that's the that creates longer chains and it's not quite so luscious on your on your on your tongue i think i like luscious i really do yes yes you want lasting flavor in your cheese perry can we just ask you because as well as being the winner you also run rennet and rind which yes. is a um place where you bring cheeses on yeah and you work mostly with restaurants you were saying yeah, and you so, bring so, them on to certain specific lights. Can you name some of the restaurants you supply and what their lights yeah. are? Well, mainly Cambridge based. So if you've been to Cambridge, phenomenal food cheap uh, scene, by the way. So you've got Restaurant 22, Midsummer House, Parker's Tavern, Vandalal here. Uh, you know, like some just pretty much where and one of our main customers is the fellows and masters of the Cambridge Colleges, which um, are, have been supportive for us for a very long time. And, and are really great customers because they, they really know their stuff and they really push you to your limits of, you know, what makes a cheese good or crafting cheeses specifically for the college. And mm. as we were talking before, you know, my job is to, you know, obviously look after the rooms and everything and, uh, and run the business on a day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, I'd go into the uh, meeting a chef, try and get a feel of his menu, what kind of foods that, that, that he's creating, where his ethos lies and then mature cheeses specifically for him. So we go in with an idea, you know, and to, to simplify it, you know, sort of young, old, young cheeses are more lactic, fresh, grassy, that area. Aged cheeses tend to be more savoury, but I'm really broad brushing there for the sake of an hour virtual. Um, and I kind of position them on where they're going to be. And we pick cheeses that have matured over certain times to go in there. And then what I was explaining before is that I will send a random batch in. So say if they like really young, fresh lactic cheeses, I tailor it to that. And then over the course of three months, I'll throw in a really ripe cheese. And if I see, you know, their sales essentially creep up there, I'll be on the phone and say, Alex, Tristan, you know, I think you, your, your, your customer base really likes aged savoury cheeses. So let's just start crafting, you know, those other five cheese profiles in that way. And uh, that kind of USP that we give to customers is really great. It, it, it's, it's what makes it so special. And as well, cutting straight from the maturing rooms. You know, so straight away, within 24 hours from cut from the maturing rooms, it's either if you've ordered online, it, it's in your hands or it's in the restaurant. And there's something about, you know, a four day period when you cut fresh from the maturing rooms where that cheese has essentially lived and been looked after to eating it it's just got this kind of almost like a golden hour where there's something you can't it's not tangible but it just tastes better it's like i always do the analogy of you know if you catch a fish at sea cook it with an hour it'd be the best fish you ever have and i think that's the same with maturing rooms um it seems you like feel you've bought them to perfection and then you're cutting them and giving them Customer. yeah exactly you know i feel like the way, where when they leave us you know and we are very strict on things not being available you know if a cheese isn't working and needs more time then you know it's it's, it's off the menu you know we'll we find a replacement for you or we change your cheese board so we're very strict on that and people will notice that you know stock of cheeses goes out quite immediately on Rennet and Rhine. I'd love it to be for tons and tons and tons of sales, but most of the time it's me saying, oh, it just needs a bit longer and it would be a disservice to send it out at, at that at the moment. Um, 
so yeah that that's the real fun of it you know and uh, when people on order online our kind of community of of, pe- of people at home love grabbing my version of cheese and then going to a you know a deli or something and finding another one and doing a comparison because that's the real judge for me you know <laughs> yeah the- yeah you want the compliment <laughs> yes yeah you would. well you want to know what you'd like so I always when I'm out of restaurants always order a cheese board because I love to know what other people are doing you know where this idea or what makes a great cheese board and it's a, a nice little sort of reality check for me for what we're doing versus everyone and I think someone's asking me what my favorite cheese is um so at the moment it's probably Mary, switch off your camera. I'm not going to say quick, so can you <laughs> just admit this? But it's, it's, it's a cheese I've been maturing for six months. This is Vibrant. So this is made by Juliana down in Wiltshire. And I wash this in a local rapeseed oil. And it's kind of like, in my opinion, the first true continental style. You know, it's very sweet. It's got that whole like an Emmental in it. Um, and it's got a real nutty roasted nut. And then that kind of note, you know, that fruity note that you only get from Conte in it. So Bybrook, these ones are great at the moment. They've come through really well. It's taken about eight months to get there with these, but we're firmly Just to there. be clear, so you get it as a hard cheese. It's not been washed, and you are choosing to wash it in whatever you want to. So you're well, making that, your own version. Well, that's, that's kind of a collaboration with Juliana. So Juliana makes Bybrook as well. She, she makes and she washes it in a rapeseed oil that's local to her. So I use ro- le- uh, rapeseed oil that's local to me, but I apply different techniques to it. You know, um, I think she does a lot of brushing where I do a lot of cloth washing. So rather than, you know, dipping a brush in and rubbing across the surface of the cheese, I'm using like a cloth to almost smother the cheese. And then as I've got to know the cheese, it likes to be sat for longer. So I was doing it at the start twice a week. Now I'm doing it every two weeks. So giving time for microbes to kind of get in there. And we're having better results. So it's a collaboration. So sometimes we do experimental things that are different with people's cheese. But most of the time, we want to work with the cheese maker, find out what works for them. And then just obviously, you know, like, like Mary's got thousands of cheeses, you know, and we're, we're, we're not that big to be able to do that. But I can say that all of our cheeses has my hands on it at least once a week, at the very least. And that's what allows us to get that real you know, hyper focus quality control in there. And Mary, I think I know you're going to definitely say a Quix cheese because, you know, it's your farm, you're in love with it. <laughs> but which of your cheeses, because you do make a variety? Oh, gosh, that's so difficult. At the moment. At oh. the moment. <laughs> well, I had an absolutely epic and awesome um, cheese, goat's cheese toasty for lunch. Um, oh, we've got a recipe coming up. <laughs> Come on, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one of those really cheap sandwich makers and yes, I just course. love yeah absolutely and um I had it with some fresh tomatoes that we grew some little fresh cherry tomatoes and that was um a bit of, and the um the goat our goat's cheese does melt it's got a lovely it melts fluffy I don't know why and is it a hard cheese or is it yes. a soft goat? Yes, you, your cheeses yeah. are all hard, aren't they? Yeah, all, yes, hard and, and cloth band. But I mean, the thing is that that, that my favourite cheese is is very often kind of the last thing that I eat. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get that. Totally get that. You know, because each one is just to enjoy. I mean, it's like, you know, ro- rolling around with it and... Um, um, well, yeah, I mean, it was interesting at the uh, at the last World Cheese Awards uh, when the the um, Jason Hines talked about the the uh, the winning cheese, which he he well, the one that eventually won the the World Champion mm-hmm. Cheese, and he described it as I want to I want to go to bed with this cheese. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and the, you know, and that is the thing. It is just a sort of. You know, there's a, just that sensuous thing about when you when you've got a lovely bit of cheese that you're eating, that you're smelling, and you're thinking about how you're going to eat it, and then you eat it, and you get all those lovely flavours. It is just, it's just a gl- a gloriously sensuous thing. You know, I mean, we just really need to eat a lot of cheese. Really, that's. The thing. I'll agree with you there. I love it. And if you were to eat something or drink something with your cheese, apart from the um, mulberries that we know you have this afternoon. <laughs> 
no. Um, what's your favorite drink? Because I think you mentioned tea to me the other week. Uh, yeah, I had a, um, a um, one of those lovely sort of singing single estate Darjeelings goes absolutely beautifully with our mature cheddar, which was just really, you know, and I, I only knew that because I put some single estate Darjeeling in my mouth when I had some cheese in my mouth, like as a sort of a happy accident. And, you know, because you've got some of those sort of dry tannins and the, that beautiful sort of delicate, those lovely delicate notes in a, in a single estate Darjeeling. And that just went, it, you know, sort of first flush type thing. And it was just, um, yeah, it sang. Yeah, you know, and did you have milk in your tea or it was black? No, the, uh, this was, well, you could hardly call it black. It's it's very pale golden. <laughs> yes. Okay. This, okay. Uh, this and if you were to green. have a sort of Christmas tipple or an alcoholic tipple with your cheese, what do you like? Ooh, wow. Well, it's amazing. It's really interesting to see. I mean, a rye whiskey is pretty epic and awesome. Um I love our, um, there's a fantastic cider maker uh, uh, near our Sanford Orchards and they produce some really interesting single variety ciders. And I think, you know, there's that thing, what grows together goes together. And I think, you know, some of those ciders, are, I, I, those, uh, and different, different ciders for different cheeses, but with our, with our um, vintage, which has got some sort of caramelly notes in it, um there's a lovely um yeah a lovely um single variety yeah that's um, lovely because i think people need to stop thinking just red wine and cheese because you can actually drink white wine and cheese you can drink whiskey as you've just said um tea i've never tried that i'm going to try it um but you can drink many many different things with cheese perry tell us yours yeah, like I, on the red wine thing, I really detach red wine and cheese in my head, really. Like the, the white wine, out of all the tastings I do, it wins pretty much every time if you're doing a strictly wine and, and cheese tasting. Now on wine, I do love a Sauterne and a blue cheese. Like yeah. I, for me, you know, the, 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 the days of Port and Stilton are a little bit behind me. Um, that kind of, the, the musty edge that kind of Port has, um, doesn't do it for me anymore. And the Sultan is just so cl clean and rich at the same time. And just that raisiny kind of vibe that it has um, with, a, with a blue cheese is literally like epic. I mean, but I do love dessert wines. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm fortunate. I don't drink too much, like, you know, sort of throughout the week. But if I do a tasting, I get gifted a bottle of dessert wine. You catch me by the fridge having a little sip every now and again. So, uh, but one of the new pairings I've discovered is actually, um, which isn't British, because we're Brennan and Ryan are strictly British, is actually maple syrup, which which is really uh, so. So um, my my friend, we were talking about on the podcast the other day, James Golden from the Pig Hotels. Um, he gets this really, you know, sort of I, I, kind of in depth maple syrup from K from Canada. I think it's just called Canada Maple. Comes in these beautiful bottles. And it has that refined sweetness, but it also has that kind of earthy tree element. So it kind of really pairs well with cheese. So, so at the moment, I'm loving it with a cheese which is called Old Winchester, which is kind of like a British Parmesan style. We keep it here in a high temperature condition to really up the crystal content. It's, it's smothered in crystals, but it's really quite tangy, tart, dry. Um, and with some maple syrup, that sweetness coming in, it, but it really brings the kind of uh, uh, um, regionality of, Win of old Winchester to the forefront. So I recommend, you know, getting a high quality maple syrup and giving that a go, uh, because that's kind of uh, topping my list recently. Oh, I'm going to try that right away. My daughter is, uh, is still living in, in Canada, so she, she sent me some really epic ma maple syrup. So... I, I'll yeah. try that with some vintage. Actually, I'll do that when I get home. That's yeah, really good. Definitely. And someone's just said maple syrup with a Gouda, but I know maple syrup with blue cheeses. Not maple syrup, I mean yeah. honey, honey with um, a blue cheese, like a Stitchelton or something like that. Is do, do you know? Nice. Do you know? Do you know what? Like a, a a sheep's blue, 
like uh, Pecorino yeah. Blue Energy. or Leeds Blue. I think that would be really nice. That kind of tang that you get from, from a sheep's milk blue. And then, you know, because we, I suppose we always talk about like how you do pairings. The most simple way I find is, you know, five simple flavors, sweet, salty, acidity, bitterness and savory. Find out in that cheese what it's missing and then, then, then put something in there that does it. So if you've got a nice creamy French, you know, like sort of uh, French Brie de Meaux or Baron Bygod, you know, they're normally quite savory, ca savory cabbagey, sparkling wine, that acidity. You find kind of what it's missing and just mm. kind of pop that up. And you find, you know, people pay a lot of money for uh, sommeliers and pairings that you become quite an expert in it when you, when you learn that little hack. <laughs> Do you think well, the interest in cheese has gone up post pandemic because people had a lot of time and so they started getting into culinary cooking and shopping better and enjoying themselves and treating themselves because they couldn't go out. But the knowledge of people's um, interest in cheese has expanded. Have you massive. seen that, Mary? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Well, what's interesting is we we created and um, very much sort of um, it came to the fore over the pandemic, we, our Academy of Cheese that we've created. And people really got into that. I mean, what was interesting is that level one was was more professionals than consumers. But actually, the level two is still more consumers than professionals. So I think people have there's a real, real appetite to to understand what you're doing. And I think may, well, I think that may well have been driven by the pandemic. People had had time to stop and reflect and and see what was in their fridges and and, um, you know, think about what they wanted to eat and think about their health and, you know, the impact of how they were living and how that had a mm. you know, what that had on their health. So I'm really hoping that that's one of the things that will I think it is. I think people have just kind of got the bug. I think it's sort of it's a case of more is best. Less is more as long as yes. it's good quality. And so yeah. you don't need a huge chunk of dodgy cheese. Just have a small mm -hmm. piece of protection. Well, yeah. I, I guess that's, uh, is, is that our answer to the cost of living crisis? Eat, eat, uh, eat, eat less, but make it really, really good. Yeah, and you'll get healthier at the same time through eating good food instead of lots of dodgy food. And what is yours, Perry? Yeah, so it's, it's, I think it's absolutely stunning, the support for British artisan cheese in recent years. You know, in pandemic has really spearheaded it and lifted it up. But I think, you know, people, have, like, I think Mary's right, people had time to engage with their food. And I always say that about cheese, you know. You know most people are so used to consuming cheese, the board's out and it's straight in the mouth. If you take 20 seconds, just look at the cheese, I, I promise you, your experience would be 20 times better and you engage a bit more. But I was, I was doing a show, um, a food show and talking about cheese that I matured specifically for it. And I turned that cheese I worked out on my kind of register log that I have on cheese 672 times over the course of its life for this special event. And when people work that out, you know, and the amount of love and care that goes in a thing they're about to eat, they immediately just get inspired by it. You know, and also it's such a direct way to support a British economy. You know, we're, we're all having difficulties at the moment, but, you know, Mary's right here. She has a family, you know, and you can visually see these people that you're supporting, which is kind of just phenomenal, really. Um, and I just love the fact that, you know, there's been counters that, are, that I've taken over it specifically in the last two years where, you know, cheese makers were in a lot of trouble. It was a really concerning time. And I, I kind of just said, just go all British, just, just, just. Let's move all continental cheeses out at that point and just go real strong British, you know, and show your support, get people really engaged. And their sales are monumental, that change, you know, all concerning. But once thorough training's there and tastings are handed out and, you know, another element of this, I'm going on about this, I get very passionate about the, supporting our, our industry, is that the British public in general are brilliant at knowing what they like and not attaching brand to it. So, you know, I, I think continental styles, people lean into Brie de Meaux, Gouders and things like that, where you have quits, you know, cheddar, yeah, you've got Bybrook, you've got Roll Right, you've got all these different varieties, which aren't, they're a, they're a style of a cheese, but they're a variation of it. And rather than going to deli counters and saying, I want this specific cheese, people are saying, 
what's like a brew? And they have five different other varieties. They get to try it. They love the interaction at the deli. And then Baron by God or Roll Riot or a cheese they've never known becomes their favourite. And I think that's really lifted up the the cheese industry in Britain. Well, I think it's great because you can get every variety of cheese here, but it might not be the original version, but you get British versions of it. And they're doing really, really well. And um, don't we make more cheeses than the French now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love you said that, Mary. Um, I've just got, I've got some very nice comments about the Academy of Cheese. So if anyone is interested, just Google it and you can go and you can learn so much um, on there. Um, there's level one, two and three, and it's tasty, it's enjoyable and it's educational. But also, Perry, what kind of wood are you aging your cheese on, please? So we went through a variety of different woods. This wood here, right here, is actually from Tim. We bought loads of wood off Tim from uh, Lincolnshire Poacher uh, just to try it out and see how it goes. But what we've noted is Scandinavian redwood pine, which has been killed dry into 12.5%, is the best wood for us. It just works. So we went through so many different varieties. There's a number of there's a number of cheeses, that you, woods that you need to be careful, like um, I think birch is one of them off the top of my head. Because one thing you're trying to create is a biofilm. So you see this uh, rind that's out here. These are letting little tendrils into the cheese, breaking down the cheese to complex amino acids, great flavors. And you want to create this thing which is called a biofilm, which is like a ring on the cheese, on the wood. And if you don't have the right wood and, uh, you know, the, the mold doesn't like it, then you essentially be killing the outside of your cheese, which would be killing flavor. So we found Sc Scandinavian redwood pine has worked really well for us which we're so pleased with because it nobody really had a real answer on, on kind of what would work and we took a gamble on, on on this wood and we're sticking with it because we're getting some really good results you know some some biofilms that stickiness created between the cheese and you know creating that you know that extra microflora on the cheese is um, really performing well and 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 also humidity wise you know, you want it to absorb as much water as possible. So when you do have a dip in the humidity, because these rooms are, are locked and they're sealed, but something happens when the humidity changes outside. I don't know if it's to do with air pressure or something. A lot of cheese uh, matures that I was talking to had trouble over Christmas with a declining uh, humidity. These woods will expel that humidity and kind of keep your room at a good kind of even level, which cheese loves. And Mary, what do you mature your cheeses on? Do you know? Well, we were told um, when we when we started making cheese again that the wood the wood to, that you matured uh, cheese on was called uh, something called obichi board, which mm -hmm. was a tropical hardwood. So we we got some of that, but that seemed kind of wrong as as uh, we went on. And what we've what we've actually taken to using is poplars from our farm uh, because poplars are well it's it's originally it was met they were used for to make cart bottoms so it doesn't splinter it's uh, we use them quite thick um, and um, the, it's it's a, a very open quite quite a, a an absorbent wood so as Perry says you've got this great reservoir of moisture that that then evens evens it out for the cheese so um yeah, where we think that that poplar is is uh, kind of work really works for us. Gosh, and can we talk about cooking with cheese now, Mary? I know you've told us about your toasty, um, but you know, is it a fondue or is it cheese on toast or is it cauliflower cheese or do you have a secret recipe that you both love um, oh. that you always use? Oh, well, I mean, cheese cheese goes on pretty much i mean the thing about cheese i'm talking about perry and uh, uh what perry was saying about pairing what you've got with cheese is it's got that l luscious fattiness you've got some salt you've got some sharp and you've got some umami you know as that will be what you will find in most cheese obviously particular cheeses will dial up or down and there'll be some some other flavor notes but what what it, once you've got that it means that you can put an umami heart to whatever you you put it with. So I 
I tend to put cheese with really quite a lot of things. Um, and in particular, well, one of the things I love growing, growing salads. My garden is about growing salads every day of the year. And, and uh, our cheese, our cheese, our, our um, um, vintage cheddar will be my favorite or the extra mature will be really, really nice with a, with a good oil, either a, a virgin rapeseed or an olive oil and uh, apple cider vinegar um, uh, to, to really put that umami heart. But the thing that I've been doing recently has been, because I had COVID and I was hungry all the time, which was my, the sort of odd symptom I had, was roasting vegetables from my garden uh, in goose fat. And then, uh, and then, if you like, reheating that with a layer of our cheese, uh, of a, um, uh, um, and that was with vintage. Um, and that gay adds, and some of uh, that Alpen cheddar that we make as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that gives it, certainly with the Alpen cheddar, it's like a sort of instant raclette. Um, but the, Can I just ask you, you roasted the vegetables. Roasted and the vegetables in goose fat, yeah. In goose fat, and then... Yes. When you wanted to eat it, you grated your cheese on top uh, of it, or a flat piece. A, a flat piece. I like those those, those yeah, Bosco those scraper. Dutch. Yeah, that you yes. can you can then just layer it all over, so it's just really beautiful, good. And then you pop that back in your oven or oven yeah. or whatever till it yeah. just not golden, but just bubbling. Yeah, just enough so it's all just luscious Forcing and yummy. Your vegetables. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, that sounds delicious. And Perry, what's yours? Yeah, so I suppose I have two things. I think we are, I briefly spoke about this. A chef that I know is doing something quite clever. So the cheese that I spoke to the British uh, earlier, the old Winchester, which is British Parmesan, is that every now and again we do portioning for, for, for large events. And uh, specifically they ask us to cut off the rind. So they cut off the rind and then they take the rind. And one of the interesting things that I learned what they do with it, which is pretty cool, is get the cheese rinds and place it in a dehydrator. So they dehydrate the cheese rind, take out all the moisture, and then they put it the, these dried up cheese rinds into a, it's like a, a, a ninja or a, you know, a Nutribullet, whatever that is, a, a really fine blender, blending it and making this a marmy powder. So it's like hyper parmesan, hyper uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, savory and they use it in everything and everything tastes so good so <laughs> if there's anything I, i've never i haven't got dehydrated myself but if there's anything that i've seen which you know if you want to add that kind of pure you know umami flavor into a dish that that powder is just literally you know gold dust but you know, one of the biggest things I start cooking around this year is is, is toasties. I mean, my 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 favorite. I've got a specific special recipe uh, for my toasties. So I do seventy percent Ogle Shield, which is a British raclette kind of style. Um, amazing calcium content, so it's massively stretchy. You melt it down, put it under a grill, and it crisps up like you're just some Michelin star chef. It, it's like so easy. So I do about seventy percent of that. 15% of a continental cheese in the UK, which is called Mayfield, which is sweet, so it adds that element to it. And then I use some extra mature uh, um, uh, quicks or a cheese that's the strongest for the tang. And though that free cheese mix, I've just given you the secret to the best toast that you can ever make. There's countless amounts of it. If you, if you go to Cambridge and have a toasty and it's pretty good, more than likely they're using that special mix that I'm talking about. Toasties have become very fashionable, especially between good sourdough bread and it's unctuous with butter and it's mm. lots of cheese inside it. And yeah, it's delicious. Someone's just mentioned cheese on toast um, with marmalade. Ooh. And um, well, in our house, we eat cheese on toast with Worcestershire sauce or Tabasco, which is always really nice. Um, but also someone was asking, oh, yes, another thing you can do with rinds, you can put them in soups, like long, slow soups, or you can put them in bolognese, your um, rinds, and just the flavours will come out and add richness um, so you don't waste anything. But can we also now talk about storing our cheese in the fridge? Well, do, do, you, want to, do you want to go, Mary, or...? <laughs> Well, I, you're you, you're the expert, but um, I what I realised is that butcher paper is the thing that really really makes makes the difference. 
and and also i've got a fridge um but you can do it by put, maybe putting it in the door or something um not such a cold fridge having 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 your fridge at eight or something rather than down at below five which is quite hard on the cheese is it yeah, by butcher's I, I, paper? If you haven't got it, you could use baking parchment, couldn't you? Or greaseproof uh, paper. It's grease, not quite the same. No, gre the greaseproof, um, it dries out a bit too quickly. Okay. I don't know whether, Perry, I don't know whether you could you could convert butcher paper, uh, parchment to, to um, baking parchment to butcher no. paper with a line of, with a bit of, oil on it or something it's, it's essentially how permeable that 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 cheese paper is or butcher paper is you know being you know what what you notice is that the, my, my tips are is you know if you can't build your own maturing room uh so, you know which not many people have access to to a cellar um then then your own tupperware box you know so storing that in the fridge you know humidity is the biggest enemy of cheese going off really fast so as you're opening that door you know every time you go get your milk out or for a cup of tea you're going from 40 percent down to 20 40 percent and, it, and it's like this and the cheese on the outside the good bacteria which create flavor and protecting the cheese is like i don't like this i'm gonna die and it dies and then all that kind of horrible bitter you know, uh, uh, um, um, kind of molds come into the cheese and then they grow on all the surfaces of the cheese. So Tupperware box, obviously if you go to a deli and ask them for cheese paper, they give you reams of it. You know, we put it in our boxes to send out and that's semi-permeable. Cling film is a no, in an emergency that's fine, but cling film will kill, so, so it will kill the outside of the cheese, you know, so essentially suffocate that. And then essentially that mold is like, I need to move to fertile land where I need to survive. So we move, what you notice on the cling film cheeses that you've left in your fridge, the face of the cheese will be literally covered and the rind won't. So essentially that face of the cheese will be covered in that mold. So cling film, that's what cling film does. And you know, that obviously, you know, you can cut some of that away. I'm, I'm, I'm not recommending that, but I do it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so having that and then putting in that Tupperware box uh, uh, a tea towel or a piece of kitchen cloth with some water, soaked in water, so a damp cloth, and that will keep the humidity high and actually control that cheese. So they're the best tips, but every environment is different. It's hard to kind of work out where, where that sits. But yeah, Tupperware, uh, cheese paper and a, a damp cloth of some sort of clean damp cloth in there. Um, but I'm doing a talk on this in the British Cheese Weekender, you know, so tips to basically mature your cheese at home, you know? Can I just ask you, I know you don't want to give away your great skills because this is your job, but um, two people have asked me, if they get a whole cheese, how can they bring it on at home? Ooh, so you'd have to get it when it's young. Um, you'd have to talk to the cheese maker. So the, way, the, way, the area that we start when we start working with a cheese maker on a maturing program is that we start at, you know, the, the product essentially coming in. And um, as that product, you know, product, as the cheese comes in, um, we speak to the cheese maker to see what conditions they're keeping their cheese at. So we would try and mirror, mirror those conditions and then we begin to work backwards. So trying to work out, you know, so, so, so you can't, so that's like a year kind of process that you have, but you would need probably a wine fridge. They're pretty good at controlling humidity and temperature. Um, so, you know, it, it, if you, there's different stages in, the, in, a, in a life of a, of a wine, of a cheese. So, you know, go for something safe, go for, uh, you know, a cheddar style, maybe get it three, four months, age it on, you know, hold it around about eight degrees, turn it frequently. If you see anything that you don't like, let's pull one of these out actually and show you. So this is Old Rome, which is a Wensley Dow. So you'd have to get a, a brush. You know, there's three techniques really you can do. If you've got mite developing, you want to brush that off. So long strokes off the cheese. If you want to get mold around the cheese, so if you've got flat surface molds, which these ones will have a flat surface mold, which is like these ones here, you want to do small little concentric circles, which basically lift off that mold and move it around the cheese. And then one thing that I did specifically with the cheese raffiner of the year is be aggressive with the, the edge of the cheese. So as it comes in, you kind of brush extremely high and that disrupts the mold that's in there and creates indentations in the cheese, allowing 
a more hostile takeover of your own biome that you have in your maturing rooms. Um, that's a quick cr crash course there. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. That was brilliant. I got that. Mary, can I ask you about cutting cheese on a cheese board? Do you cut the nose off, which you don't, or do you cut the, through the whole slice and why? Well, um, I, I think, you know, that whole thing about parlane, which is, uh, you know, such a, for sounds like it's just a real snob thing. But actually, the, if you think about a naturally rinded cheese, nose to rind, the, 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 the nose has, had, has actually lived in a completely different environment to the rind and it's lost more more moisture close to the rind it's developed some of those arches so arches at the nose will be um, um, sharper more buttery halfway back you'll get some more nutty notes under the rind you'll get some drier and and some earthy horseradishy notes and if you if you cut the nose uh, one person gets one flavor Whereas if you cut from nose to rind, everybody gets all of those flavors because you you have you will pay more money for a naturally rinded cheese because of all the work that you've heard that Perry and every, we put into it. So uh, don't shortchange yourself by only having one of those flavors. Make sure you get a slice of all of them. Yeah, and I love the way you say it's not the snob value. It's just to get the whole journey of the flavor of the hard work. More, more complexity, more fun, more yeah. joy. Perry, Man, tell you, us what you've you, got in your hand. Oh, I was going to say, I, I can actually illustrate, hopefully with this one. It, 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 so, so this is a cheese iron. So obviously, you know, I have all the cheese I'm maturing. I can't cut every cheese in half and see what it's like. So essentially, you know, I'll try and do this for the camera. So you pull this blade in. Oh, this is quite firm so these are nearly ready and then twist it around a few times i should have used my affineur of the year one it does remove and that would have been quite fancy um yeah so you twist it around and pull out that core on the cheese and hopefully we'll be able to roughly see what mary's talking about in terms of that gradient that runs from the rind into the center of the cheese so you're getting more paler kind of colors so more cream you know, dairy in this area, lighter. Towards the rind is always more savouriness that's in there, you know. So, um, yeah, I'll um, I'll try this. I don't want to waste, a, a, you know, a, a, a perfectly good tasting experience, really. You know? But, um, yeah, I haven't tried these in, a, in about a month, so. And they're delicious. Good news. A little bit tangy. Which cheese which, is um, that? Which I wasn't at. Oh. So this is Bybrook, my favourite cheese. And then you do a better job at pushing that in, but. I knew I was going to mess that live. And then you push in the core there. And then essentially, you know, the cheese is sealed and it does minimal damage to the cheese, you know. Um, but I probably should have used a larger iron on that one because it's a bit thicker. And then I have a snack for myself because I failed to do it live on camera. I never lived that down, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, has anyone got any questions before we round up? Or Mary and Perry, have you got a one last minute, something you would like to add to all our cheese lovers out there who want to know about cheese? One last tip? Just enjoy, joy and pleasure, legal and good for you. Um, <laughs> so, you so you can get, you know, you can get very complicated about it, but as Perry said, take the time to, 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 to um, understand what you're eating and just take the time to get the layers of flavor so that you get m maximal pleasure. That's a good thing in life. Maximum pleasure in life is always good. Perry, can you just repeat what your favorite cheese is? Oh, so, so that was Vibrook, the one I just tried. So I'm really happy with where that is at the moment. It's a sweet continental style, washed in a local rapeseed oil. That's available online, these batches are. So I've got, in, in this batch I'm about to release, I've got uh, 12, 12 cheeses. So there'll be 12 cheeses available and then the next ones will be ready when they're ready. It's a very small batch that we're, we're maturing on those. So you can get those, obviously Google search us, runitandrind.co.uk. The closest to a St. Marceline style was St. Jude, I would say. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I just saw that flick up, yeah. which is made on the same farm as Baron Bygod, um, which is a cracking cheese and, and very sea, very uh, variable. You know, there's some real really? kind of 
really um, kind of farmyard flavors, and then sometimes they're really creamy. So I love the variability of a uh, Judith, isn't it? Judith, Judith cheese, yeah, that she makes down there. So yeah. When you send out your boxes or you'll send out your cheeses, Mary, do you send out crackers or anything specific to eat them with? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I like those um, uh, kind of quite plain crackers, so that you you don't have something that's sort of dominating that's that's bossing the cheese about. Uh, I used to just eat cheese by itself, but actually, I really do like a cracker. There's something quite nice about that that um, the sort of sweet and 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 crunch of a cracker. Um, although I I once did a tasting to some French journalists, and they said. Um, je ne veux pas manger uh, les bâtiments. I don't want to eat buildings. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Perry, so, uh, do you send out? Yeah, yeah. So, so in our mystery cheese boxes, so that's a plan over, so I plan 12 months ahead each month of um, um, cheeses that we're going to put in the boxes. So they have a focal theme on, on one or two cheeses and I build around that. Obviously, you get the tasting video with there. So as of hopefully next month, I'll be presenting in these rooms, talking about how we got here, why we selected it. And um, yeah, yeah, that they've been really popular for people to try the, the variety in cheese. And it's really interesting when people have cheese in January and then they have it again in November and it's a stark difference to where it is. And that's what I love about maturing cheese. That although I mature 62 to 75 varieties of cheese and that's growing, um, they're different every single week. And that's the great thing about British cheese is that the experience that you have today will be the same, not the same as a, a week's time or a month's time. And um, everyone just keep on supporting the British cheese industry because we're fantastic at making cheese, maturing cheese. And yeah, uh, we're, we're, um, we're, we're, it's an industry we all should be really proud of. That's my last cutaway. <laughs> well, that's absolutely brilliant. Well, listen, I want to thank um, Mary and Perry so much for joining us. Um, the session has been recorded, so you can watch it um, again live on CKBK. And um, there are many thousands of cheese recipes on CKBK where you can use all their delicious cheeses to make your favorite dish. And as Mary says, just live and love it and be safe. Um, and please do follow the Cookbook Kitchen uh, CKBK. I'm confusing my, there's too many going on. And also the Chiswick Cheese Market. The next market we have is on the 16th of October. We run on the third Sunday of every month from nine o'clock till 3.30. And we have um, Mary's cheeses are on sale there at the Heritage Stand. We have up to 52 stalls now. We've just been extended and you can just relish in beautiful cheeses. So thank you very Fair much on. for listening, everyone. And thank you again, Mary and Perry. And that's over and out for us. And go and make yourself a lovely cheese sandwich. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, uh, the United States, uh, mail order from Murray's. Just seen that question in the, in the chat. Great answer. I'll um, send that through to everyone. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks a thank lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.